Okay, hi everybody. Welcome to the first in a series of eight, maybe even more, um, sessions on globalization. And we're going to look first of all at uh, uh, globalization first, and then we'll look at trade. Just turn off my second sound system here. There we go. Hopefully, I, I can hear myself speak now. Sorry about that. Okay, so let's start by uh, looking at globalization. We're going to spend about 15 minutes on some key aspects. And there's plenty of opportunity for you to throw some really great answers into the chat window. Uh, and uh, we'll pick the best out, show them on the screen. There's a collective wisdom about this group, which is unbelievable based on past sessions. And I think this group will carry each other through the way, all the way to paper two on Monday. Let's start by looking at the world economy and globalization. I want to just give you a couple of absolutely key statistics uh, to kick us off. The first is just to get a feel for the where the world economy is at the moment. And this is one of those key stats that I think is hugely important. It takes the world economy, world GDP, uh, adjusts for purchasing power parity, which is quite important, and then says, well, where, you know, where is the balance of power in the world economy at the moment? And if you have those two numbers together, they add up to 100%, do the maths. Emerging market and developing countries nearly, now have nearly 60%, 60% of world GDP. Whereas if we take all the high income nations in the world, Japan and Germany, UK, United States and Canada, et cetera, they only have 42%. So there has been over the last 15, 20 years, a pivotal shift in the balance of power in the world economy. And then on the next slide, we just go one level down. So, well, let's break that down still further. The European Union, of course, the UK no longer a member, that has 15% of GDP. Uh, Latin America, the Caribbean countries, 7%. The whole of the Middle East and Central Asia, 7%. But look at Sub-Saharan Africa, only 3.2% of world GDP. Now, keep, that, keep those stats in mind because 
they give a sense of the feeling for where the balance of power is, where the center of gravity is in the world economy. Okay, so the next thing to look at is to ask this question. Have a go in chat. What share of global GDP do you think the UK has? This is for 2020, 21 figures. Post, post your answer in chat. Let's see what comes up. What share of GDP, global GDP, do you think the UK has? So Russell says 12%. Tom says 1.7%. Harvey says 2%. Uh, Ewan says 5%. Uh, well, some great answers. Holly says 5%. And uh, Jacob says 5 Jojo says 7 Huge variation there. Let's put the answer up. The answer is 2.3 or 2.2%, depending on which year you take. So this is the latest data from the IMF. Again, just a little bit of application here. So the, the UK economy, you spend so much time studying the UK economy, all the different policies and issues. Uh, they only have two, just over 2% of the world world GDP. Wow. Here's my next question. <laughs> Based on PPP, making that PPP adjustment, which do you think is the world's biggest economy? Have a go, please type your answer into the chat window, which is the world's largest economy? Okay, let's wait for these answers to come through. People are still posting in the, uh, the numbers here. What's the world's largest economy? Charlie says the United States. C1 says Azerbaijan. I think you're referring there to the Eurovision Song Contest, possibly. Fatima says China. Um, let's say Blue Ark says USA. So there seems to be a gap, a difference of opinion here. Some people saying China um, and one or two people saying India. Well, here's the answer. On a PPP basis, uh, the answer isn't even close. On a PPP basis, the answer is China. China is the world's largest economy with 18% global GDP. Of course, at market exchange rates, it's, it's well below the United States. USA goes up to about 20% of the world economy. But look at look at the other parts of that table. Uh, India comes third. So India on this basis is over you know, nearly, well, <laughs> certainly nearly twice as large as, as, as Germany, for example. Uh, the UK comes in, what, 10th, a little bit below France. By the way, these are the countries in the world with just over or around 2% or less of world GDP, including Mexico, Turkey, Indonesia. These are really interesting countries and often the focus of an exam question. Okay, moving on. Globalization, a few minutes, if it's okay with you, let's spend about 10 minutes or so thinking about globalization. Uh, it's a huge, huge issue. Uh, it's a process by which countries become more interconnected and interdependent. And of course, that's the nature of the globalized world we live in. Where we are linked through those networks of trade and capital flows and the huge and the diverse spread of technology and global media. That's the way the world lives. Uh, moving on, um, here's a, a, a aspects of globalization. Uh, world trade in 2018, the value of world trade was $25 trillion, but it fell by about 10% in 2020. So obviously, obviously the pandemic caused a huge shock to the world economy, but the size of trade is huge. Come back to that in a second. And of course, we have the rise of transnational bands and, and multinational corporations. Nestle, for example, manufactures Kit Kats in, in 16 different countries. Here's, a, here's some really interesting data for you. Uh, if you take the trade to GDP ratios for selected countries. So if you're looking for examples of countries for the exam, that are hugely, heavily dependent on trade. Here are four great examples for you. You may well have studied them as part of your economics papers. Singapore, trade to GDP, by the way, adds together the value of imports and exports, because that's trade, goods and services coming in, goods and services leaving. We add them two together and express as a show of GDP. So Singapore, one of the world's hub economies, has a value of trade nearly four times its national income. Uh, Ireland is one of the most globalized countries on the planet, two and a half, two and a, uh, two and eight percent. Vietnam, I think, fascinating country to study, um, two hundred percent. Slovakia, a tiny country inside the European Union, heavily dependent on trade with the European Union. Eighty-five percent of trade, um, Slovakian trade, is with countries like Germany and Poland and Hungary and so on. But trade is nearly twice their national income. So for these countries. 
globalization truly does matter. It's absolutely front and central to what they're about. Whereas in stark contrast, Nigeria's trade is one fifth of its GDP, Brazil a quarter, United States likewise. Obviously these have huge domestic markets, but they're not as open to trade as the countries above. I just thought I'd show you this, this slide. I think it's a really nice contrast between those highly open, dynamic globalizing countries and countries for whom globalization is perhaps less significant. That could be an evaluation point for you in your papers. Okay, another aspect of globalization clearly uh, are things like uh, global supply chains, uh, companies um, sourcing their products from many, many different countries. We call this, by the way, deep, deep specialization or deep division of labor, breaking down the production chain in terms of components, raw materials, design, et cetera. That's a huge issue. And labor migration. I'm not, I'm not picking questions here, but the migration of people across borders is, uh, is clearly a huge economic issue in macro terms. In the year before the pandemic, according to the International Labor Office, there were 169 million migrants. Now that's not an accurate measure probably, but it's, a, it's an interesting figure. It's about 5% of the global labor force is migrant workers. So obviously for some countries, it's much, much higher than that. And just another one, though, quick one before we get you uh, uh, focusing on some questions. Here's just a really good example of globalization. This is the, a chart showing Boeing's global supply chain. Now the different parts of the aircraft from the States, from Canada, from Asia, from Europe. Uh, that, is, that is deep specialization of labor. Okay, here's a question for you in chat. Let's test how good our macroeconomics is. Let's see some brilliant answers coming through. Can you please give me, if you want, three, three benefits of globalization for people in a country of your choice? Over to you, 30 seconds. Some great answers there. Ramona, I think, started the one we highlighted at the start. And what was great about her answer was she picked out the idea of, cons uh, of comparative advantage. Uh, Bavia uh, talks about choice, lower prices for consumers. Emily, great answer there. Comparative advantage and specialization leads to increased efficiency. Andrea says increased consumer surplus, more choice, increased quality. Some great answers. Alice says closer ties between countries. Uh, Alex mentions increased job opportunities from foreign investment. Um, some great answers there. Uh, superb. But don't forget, by the way, the chat window is a place where we have amazing things happen. We have some superb economists, amazing economists who produce some superb answers. So thank you for those. Here's a few that I picked out. I mean, you could pick that. You could have so many, couldn't you? Here's a, here's a, take out the music, Jim, please. <laughs> okay. So lower prices, uh, higher real incomes. So, so yeah, so obviously globalization in theory brings prices down. And of course, then link that to real incomes. So prices fall, the price of imported energy goes down, your real income goes up, in part due to increased market competition. The wider issue is about the opportunity to travel and live and work and love in many different countries. And I think also um, efficiency was mentioned by some people there. I bring in dynamic efficiency, the benefits from the rapid spread of ideas, the diffusion of ideas across borders, uh, linked, of course, in part to migration. So you get a faster rate of product and process innovation, which enhances dynamic uh, efficiency there. Okay, well, let's back to you on the next question. Uh, those are some of the benefits of globalization. Uh, over to you. Can you give me three disadvantages, please, of globalization for economic agents? That means producers or consumers in a country of your choice. 30 seconds.
Wow. So again, some amazing answers there. Uh, if, if the sprinkler system goes on, by the way, in two to two towers, it's because these answers are with you on fire as a group. Some great concepts there. Structural unemployment mentioned, inequality mentioned. Now, here's one from Abisha, if you can leave this one up. A fantastic answer. Comparative advantages will change over time. And so companies may leave the country when it no longer offers an advantage. We call that, by the way, footloose capital, which will cause structural unemployment and reduce growth. That is a brilliant answer from Abisha because it, it basically builds a chain of reasoning. Ideally, what you then do is get a little bit of application and give an example of an industry or a country which might be affected by that. Let's pick out a couple more, maybe. Disadvantages of globalization. Uh, what can we see? Emily says dilution of culture, exploitation of workers. Victoria says negative externalities of production, which may come as a consequence of pollution. Uh, Lucas talks about over specialization leading to reliance on primary extraction. Yeah, so countries may become too dependent on a fairly narrow range of, of, uh, of products there. Archie talks about the possibility of a brain drain, which is a really good point. Uh, and a lot of you now mentioning um, the risks of structural unemployment and actually in particular, the hollowing out of sort of middle, middle class, middle income jobs as, as manufacturing in particular um, leaves the country. What have I picked out? I, I would always stress environmental aspects, the threat to the environment, obviously the, the global commons, that's sort of the idea of the global commons as a resource increased output and trade so things like food miles and that kind of stuff and the externalities from shipping and from aviation and so on and also the externalities from farming associated with mass agricultural production point two hugely important the risk of growing relative poverty are linked to structural unemployment it's often the case it's sometimes called the paradox of globalization so let me just spend 30 seconds on this the power <laughs> oh my, the, the sprinklers will be coming on soon uh it oftentimes with globalization uh, globalization reduces inequalities between countries, but it can also increase inequality within countries. It's one of those paradoxes, particularly in countries like, for example, the United States. And the possible loss of cultural diversity from the growing dominance of TNCs is another aspect. Now, there are many, many, but you just pick out those ones that you think are, are relevant to you. Let me just finish this section of globalization by looking at two things. One is something that was mentioned in the chat that countries such as Slovakia and Ireland and Singapore, and but every country, but in particular those countries with a high trade to GDP ratio, are often impacted by uh, external shocks. So one of the dangers of globalization is that your country becomes more interdependent, which is good, but you become uh, exposed to the vulnerabilities of external shocks. The global financial crisis hitting countries like Spain and Greece, amongst others, the impact of the pandemic uh, affecting in particular low income countries, uh, especially very volatile world commodity prices. Uh, somebody mentioned primary product dependence there and the wider threats from geopolitical uncertainty. Clearly, we see that at the moment and the risks from global terrorism. So globalization has many advantages, but uh, the increased exposure to susceptibility to external shocks is something I would definitely focus on in an evaluation question on globalization. And the other thing I just want to pick out on the next slide is this concept of deglobalization. Uh, hopefully you've spent a little bit of time revising this. So can we spend two minutes on this as, as a group? Deglobalization is kind of reverse globalization where trade as a share of GDP might go down, where foreign investment as a share of GDP might, might go down. I'm going to give you three or four reasons why deglobalization uh, might be happening. There's disagreement here. But this is just something to be aware of, and it's superb for evaluation. First reason is the rise, as you've seen, of populist politics from Hungary to the United States and, uh, and beyond. And in particular, the growth of non-tariff barriers. So things like import quotas, embargoes, domestic subsidies. Uh, that's really something to revise. So link, please, your revision for protectionism with deglobalization. That's quite important. The second is linking to exchange rates. So uh, we are seeing a return. So quite a few countries now bringing in capital controls, limiting the amount of hot money that, that can flow across borders, for example. And more countries now moving towards managed floating exchange rates, uh, in particular moving away from free floating. So using the exchange rate as a tool of monetary policy, especially with interest rates being so low, maybe the exchange rate now becomes the separate golf club in the bag, if you like. 
We've seen the rise of economic nationalism, particularly during the pandemic, disputes over vaccine exports, blocking mergers and takeovers, et cetera. Point four is for those business students out there. And we are seeing this just today, uh, Apple announcing they're shifting iPad, iPad production out of China into Vietnam. A lot of companies moving production uh, away from those long extended supply chains and bringing them closer to home. Global supply chain resilience has been, has been threatened by the pandemic. So we're starting to see a lot of reshoring of manufacturing, bringing production back home. And the free flow of migration, of course, is a, in a hot economic as well as political issue. Many more countries now using selective migration controls, including the UK post Brexit. There we go. That was 15 minutes or so on globalization. Hopefully that was useful. If it's okay with you, I just want to spend 10, 15 minutes now on trade and we'll post some questions at the end. We'll have time for some questions. Let's do 15 minutes together on international trade. I've got three, you've probably played Wordle over the last few months. Let's play Tradle. So here we go. I've got three export charts for you. On the left-hand side, what they export. On the right-hand side, where they export to. What, which country uh, do you think this is the trade pattern for? On the left-hand side, their exports, just goods, by the way, not services. On the right-hand side, where they export their products to. What do we think for this one? Uh, export pattern for which country what do you reckon for this answers are coming through let me pick out one or two of the answers as they come in so uh olivia says vietnam jacob says south korea um ewan says united states could be fatima says the uk it's not the uk it's not the uk um and joe says syria not sure we've got real real data on syria to show you rehan says taiwan interesting and victoria says the netherlands as far as I can see, we've only had, oh, Lady Bella's got the right answer. And so too does Matthew Jones. Congratulations. It is indeed Vietnam. I think a really, really interesting country to study. I might actually do a country profile video on Vietnam this week. It is absolutely fascinating from a development perspective. Here's another one. I've got three for you. Okay, which country is this? On the left-hand side, what they export. And on the right-hand side, to whom do they export? I'll give you a clue here. It's not Vietnam. So what do we reckon? Ankit says Singapore. Quite a few people saying Singapore. Hugh comes in with Brazil. And, oh, by the way, sorry, th th these are for the same country. So on the left-hand side is what they export. And on the right-hand side, the destination. So the countries they export to. Emily says China. Cormac thinks it's Turkmenistan. And a couple more, uh, Olivia thinks it's South Korea. And one more, Jacob thinks it's Bangladesh. Interesting, Jacob, that would be green. That would be hugely textiles if that was Bangladesh. Well, congratulations to Olivia and Sarah. The answer is South Korea. Now a high income country with a very detailed manufacturing, very strong in manufacturing products, TV screens and cars, integrated circuits, etc. One more for you. This is fun, isn't it? Tradle. Now, I'll give you a clue. This is the hardest of the three. The hardest of the three. So on the left-hand side, what they produce. On the right-hand side, where they where the output goes. Have you noticed that all three have a very heavy export dependence on the Asian economy? Obviously, China is one. Uh, somebody's just pointed out to me in chat. If you look on the right-hand side, uh, it, the, the correct answer cannot be the countries listed on the right-hand side which is a really good way of pointing out that. It's not Australia, by the way. 13% of the exports go to Australia. What do we think? Matt says Mexico. Um, I hope Matt, Matt's not doing a level geography. Uh, Amy says New Zealand. Uh, Raheem says Canada. And Chris thinks it's Malaysia. I'll give you a couple more seconds on this one. Uh, we've already had South Korea. Ah, yeah. Benna says it's the North Pole. That's a good example. Good example. The trade data on the North Pole is uh, not yet out for 2021. Daniel says Kenya. And ah, Olivia, Oliver, sorry, and Kate have both got the run. So here we go. It is New Zealand. Which, of course, has just signed a trade deal with the UK. Massive deal for the UK. 0.1% of our exports go to New Zealand. 
well done on that little tiny point ahead of the exams probably more relevant if you're doing excel by the way the development appears on paper three not paper two but do have a little cluster of countries that you know quite a bit about it does help you put in that applied information which is so useful if you get a question saying using a country of your choice okay let's go back to our team team economics here we go can you give me please three gains from trade in goods and services for a developing country 30 seconds have a go Lots of uh, people on my on my uh, stream, lots of people still talking about which countries they are. What about gains from trade? Here's, here's a point from Gareth. Excellent starting point. Thank you. Uh, sorry, can you go back to the Gareth one, Jim, if that's possible? Thank you. Or oh, the previous one. Uh, okay. So Fifi says that uh, gains from trade include FDI, export-led growth, increased employment due to FDI. That's a great point. Um, okay. Other gains from trade, please, for developing countries. Naomi says rising employment and higher incomes, increased FDI and higher tax revenues, which can be spent on public services. Excellent point. Really good point. Hugo says more jobs, more exports. So AD increases multiplier effect of an increase in demand. Hugo, that's a great point. I'd actually bring in the out of the export multiplier. Think about the industries that are connected directly to trade in goods and services, things like trade finance and logistics, uh, ports and airports, etc. And uh, Chanel says, shift outwards of AD, since X minus M is a component of aggregate demand. It is indeed. Don't forget, by the way, that paper two includes all your year 12 material, your year one mac macro. Don't be afraid to go back to ADAS analysis. Isabel says, they tend to grow faster. This is true. And so let me just focus on this. So Ismail, uh, uh, Ismail's answer. So developing countries that trade more tend to grow faster. They tend to innovate more quickly. They tend to raise productivity. And that provides higher incomes and more opportunities for their people. Wow, there's some amazing answers there. And if you're, if you're following the chat, uh, you'll see lots of good ones. And here's my three, that little introduction. So this is one of the gains from trade. Uh, I'm trying to put in here some key terms. One of the differences about a great answer on, on Monday as opposed to a good answer is just the use of key terms. So point one, specialization can lead to economies of scale, higher productivity, and therefore increased per capita incomes. So in that one sentence, you've got economies of scale, you've got efficiency and per capita incomes. And that's a really quite a powerful point. Uh, for a developing country in particular, exports generate foreign exchange, you know, dollars or yuan or whatever it is. And those dollars can then be used to fund the importation of essential products, which could be energy, it could be pharmaceuticals, it could be car parts, who knows. And crucially, and don't be afraid to go back to microeconomics in paper two. Open trade makes domestic markets more contestable, uh, and that can lead to falling prices and higher real incomes that lifts the, like, the real product wage of people in, in countries. Uh, a really good point from Invict, how a DOMA model is via higher export revenues, allowing for investment in capital. Superb answer. Okay, next slide. Uh, let's think about uh, the analysis. I just want to spend with you, if it's okay with you, just a couple of minutes, just working through one example of PPF analysis. Now, this may not be the example you've revised, but I'm going to work through it anyway, just so everybody's happy with it. If you get a question on gains from trade, you'll need an analysis diagram. Now, you can use supply and demand. That's fine. You can use one of those little matrix tables. That's fine. Uh, I'm going to use PPF analysis with you. So let me just work through this with you. If everybody can focus on the screen for a couple of minutes. We have two countries here, Mexico and Brazil, and they're producing steel and wine. Now, the PPFs here are straight lines because we're assuming constant returns. There's no diminishing returns. You'll see that Mexico has the absolute disadvantage. It can't produce as much steel or wine as, as Brazil. Uh, it's pretty close in wine, though. It's 200 to 250, whereas it's 100 to 250 in terms of steel. So moving on, uh, that means that 
uh, if Mexico doesn't specialize, they could produce 50 units of steel and 100 units of wine. And the next draw is Brazil couldn't could choose not to specialize. They go to 125 of steel and 125 of wine. Uh, that, those are the outputs halfway down the PPFs without any specialization. Well, Mexico uh, has a comparative advantage in the production of wine. What Mexico, if you think about the opportunity cost here for a second, the gradients of those two lines, Mexico has to give up one unit, five units of steel and gets 10 units of wine, 100 to 200, that's 0.5. Whereas Brazil, it's one to one. So the differences in the gradient tell you the comparative advantage. And they tell you that Mexico has the relative advantage in, um, in the situation in wine, and Brazil has the advantage in steel. So Mexico is going to produce more wine and Brazil is going to move left up towards the top on steel. The key is the gains from trade. So given that the opportunity cost ratio is 0.5 for Mexico and one for Brazil, there is a gap shown here on the slide. There's a gap where a ratio in between that gap will benefit both countries. And if we move on to the next slide for gains from trade to occur, Countries need to agree a mutually beneficial terms of trade. And uh, well, in this case, both countries can benefit if two units of steel are traded for three units of wine. OK, let's go back to our diagram. So Mexico is going to trade two steel for three wine. So in theory, it could go to 200 wine and then trade that for steel and then they put one, three, three steel, 200 divided by th whatever, two thirds. <laughs> Now, that red dotted line is what I call a consumption possibility line with trade. The next slide, Brazil could, in theory, produce 250 units of steel, uh, give up two for three wine. So, you know, if it didn't trade, it would have to give up one for one. That gives up two for three. So that's, be that's better for Brazil. And in theory, it won't happen, but they could get 375 of wine. Well, the drunken Brazilians, if that was the case. But can you see that the, the red dotted line has the same gradient for both countries? We found a terms of trade that benefit both countries. You don't necessarily have to do the math, so that diagram will be fine. All you have to say is the next slide shows this. Both countries could move on to that red dotted line. There's Brazil's consumption possibility. The next slide shows Mexico's consumption possibility. Both countries could move on to that dotted line and consume more of both. This diagram shows potential gains from trade based on the law of comparative advantage. Now, presentations available pretty much straight after the today's session to so be able to work through this build with me uh, in, 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 in your, at your own speed. I'll post, we'll take questions in a second. Just one more slide to go in the session today. I think if you get a question on trade, part of the evaluation is to challenge assumptions. So it's really important to check to state the assumptions of the underlying trade theory and then perhaps challenge them. Four key assumptions. First of all, we assume constant returns to scale. And all that means is output is proportionate to input. If we double the resources in steel, we get double the output. Well, that's nonsense. Clearly, there won't be constant returns to scale. There could be diminishing returns, but there could be increasing returns. The gains from trade could be even higher if specialization leads to economies of scale. We assume high factor mobility between industries. People moving out of steel into wine and people moving out of wine into steel, they're equally productive. Of course, they won't be. We know there's occupational immobility, differences in relative productivity barriers to mobility of labor. We assume there are lo low or zero trade frictions across borders, that trade can move, goods and services can move easily across borders. Well, that assumes free trade, frictionless trade. Post-Brexit, we're understanding what some of those trade frictions are with the European Union, for example. And crucially, and again, don't, don't be afraid to go back to your micro, the absence of externalities, both in production and consumption. So oftentimes trade brings negative externalities deforestation in Brazil, palm oil, uh, deforestation in Indonesia, etc. Externalities from industrial farming and fishing. Those externalities can change the social welfare of active trade in addition to the economic 
effects. There we go. So we've done 15 minutes on globalization and 15 minutes on trade. I've got a minute or so before we have to close the session down. I'm very, very happy to take any questions. Maybe Jim, who's producing the show today, can pick out a couple of questions and put them on the screen for me. We've got over 800 students live this afternoon and thousands will join in later. So a huge thanks for all the contributions. Uh, <laughs> What are some of the evaluation points for globalization? Well, I think the key thing there is to be aware of the costs and benefits and to have a few countries, to have a few countries that you can refer to. So I think, for example, Vietnam and Bangladesh uh, are two really good, Ethiopia, that's the countries that have benefited from globalization, Singapore, Ireland, uh, have those little case studies to hand. Whereas in the United States, um, we, we've seen the, the huge rise in inequality and high unemployment in some states linked to loss of manufacturing. Maybe we've got time for a couple more questions. Can you make a video stream on key diagrams for paper two? Yes. Okay. What we're doing here, Barry, Barry's tech actually, uh, is we've got a new collection on the Tutor2 website of macro diagrams. So I put in some trade diagrams. I put in some um, uh, ADS diagrams, put one on the Lorenz curve, and I'll be adding to those in the next couple of days. Just go to the collection site on Tutor2. We'll probably post a link in the chat and you'll be able to see those. A couple more questions before we finish. Don't forget we have a 4.30 stream today on economic growth if you want to join me for about 20 minutes or so. Oh, ben, ben asked the, the question of the day, what's your view on Bingley's mega chipper? Well, it's a great example, Ben, of the power of TikTok. And the power of social media. This this nondescript chip shop in Coventry has become the the centre of the world, the centre of world economic gravity. Absolutely fantastic example. And very canny operators how they've used social media. Great question from GLM. Which countries are the best examples of primary product dependency? You're probably looking at countries like Zambia for copper, and maybe the Ivory Coast for cocoa. Um, there's loads of good examples. Um, in a way, Australia might be chosen. Very heavy dependence on coal and iron ore, uh, et cetera. Uh, very strongly linked to the Chinese economy. Any other questions? Oh, yeah, thank you for Bowsy Boy. It says Angola, 97% of exports are oil. Alex asked a question, why do we use two steel, three wine? Well, because the, the two ratios were 0 0.5 to 1 two internal opportunity cost ratios, 0 0.5 to 1. So there's a gap between 0 0.5 and 1. If you find a, a terms of trade that lies within that gap, two thirds lies between half and one. We did when I did maths at school. Yeah, Pete asked a key question. I'll come back to in the next question. Is it worth faking a heart attack in the exam if you don't know what to write? Probably not. You might get a special consideration. Invix says, in the 25 market, when asked you to answer with reference to a developing country, ah, do you mention just one country or can you talk about multiple? Okay, thank you for this question. This is hugely important. My strong advice, my very strong advice, is to talk about just one country. You might bring a second country into the final conclusion, but please focus on one country. The examiners want you to show off your knowledge of a country, your application, and it's best if you've got something to say about one country. That means you don't have to revise many, just have a little cluster. I've asked my students to have uh, to have revised four for their exams on Monday and also for paper three. Uh, Fatima says, quote a diagram, please. And the quote a diagram, Fatima, is in the diagram link. We will post a link certainly on the Twitter account and social media accounts to our collection of macro diagrams. Uh, Juno says, what's transfer pricing? We'll do that to you tomorrow. We're going to look at corporate tax avoidance under fiscal policy. And transfer pricing is essentially where companies are able to um, basically book out the profits they make in one country by transferring them to another country where corporation tax is lower. And as a result, they pay less tax. So Starbucks UK pays Starbucks Ireland a transfer fee, essentially for using the brand as corporation tax in Ireland at the moment is less than it is in the UK. Birthday shout out for Alice. Happy birthday, Alice. Presumably it's the 18th if you're taking edibles. 
It's your 15th birthday, you're a child genius. Uh, okay, any other questions? Uh, how it says, have you done videos in different countries? Yes, uh, the, but they're two or three years old, so you might want to update those. And Jay asked the question that everybody's asking, Newcastle Champions League next season. Well, I think you just cross out the word league, actually, Jay. Um, clearly, clearly the answer is yes. Amazing things are happening in uh, in NE2, which is Newcastle United's postcode. Okay, folks, we've done 35 minutes. Huge thanks, as always, for those who just joined me. This is the first of probably eight or nine sessions. The next one is on economic growth in about an hour's time, just under an hour's time. Please join me for that. Huge thanks to everybody who's posted the, the answers in, in chat. It's amazing the quality of answers. You're in great shape for Monday, but together, I think, over the next few days, we can really get there. And uh, in the words of a famous economics online presenter, we can smash those exams. Take care. See you soon.